Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ambassador Kamal Sibyl, former Foreign Secretary, Mr. Nikhil Sani, Vice President Daima, and Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Triveni Turbine Limited, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to have you all with us today and a very warm welcome to you in IMA's 56th Leaders, Leaders Speak session. Today, we are privileged to have India's former Foreign Secretary and former Ambassador, Dr. Kamal Sibyl, with us. Ambassador Sibyl, it is a pleasure to have you and many thanks for agreeing to do this session. You've had a long and distinguished career as a professional diplomat, and you have served in many countries that are key to India's geopolitical, security, and economic interests. In the early part of your career, you were posted in Paris, Dar es Salaam, Lisbon, and Kathmandu, and later you served as India's ambassador in Turkey, Egypt, France, and Russia. You also served as Deputy Chief of Mission in India's Embassy in Washington, Washington, D.C., and as Joint Secretary for West Europe. You received the Padma Shri from the Government of India in 2017 for your distinguished services in public affairs. You have witnessed many epochs in geopolitics and international relations, and you're uniquely qualified to make an assessment of the prevailing geopolitical situation from an Indian perspective and offer a prognosis of the next world order. We could not have had a better speaker on today's topic, which is whether a multipolar world is an inevitable inevitability or merely a wishful thinking. Many thanks once again, and a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Nikhil, it is a pleasure to have you with us, and thank you so much for agreeing to moderate this conversation with Dr. Sibyl. A business leader with global customers and partners, you keep a close eye on international affairs, and we look forward to an exciting chat between you and Dr. Sibyl on India's place and role in the contemporary geopolitics. A very warm welcome to you. Ladies and gentlemen, for many years, especially since America's financial meltdown, there's been a growing talk about the world having mul multiple superpowers instead of a single hegemony, which has been US since the 1980s. The idea has been promoted aggressively by both the anxious Americans and the aspirational emerging powers such as China, India, Brazil, and Russia. However, a peaceful transition to a multipolar world does not look inevitable anymore as the incumbent hegemon and the two key claimants to new superpowers status, which are Russia and China, are entangled in an escalating conflict via a proxy war in Ukraine. The US has thrown the kitchen sink at Russia in the form of sanctions across finance, business, trade, sports, travel, and anything else it can weaponize. It has recruited the whole world in an all out economic, diplomatic, and ideological effort to corner Russia and drain it out of Ukraine. India is being wooed by both sides because of its friendly relations across the trenches and also its geopolitically important location, size, and strength. It is a pivotal moment in India's foreign policy and its aspiration of being one of the leaders in a multipolar world. We are privileged to have Dr. Sibyl with us to help us understand where India stands and which way it must go to protect its interests and achieve its aspirations. With these words, it is my pleasure to hand over the session to Mr. Sony to conduct, conduct it going forward. Over to you, Nikhil. Thank you very much, Rekha. Ambassador Kanwal Sibyl, former Foreign Secretary of India, Rekha Sethi, Director General IMA. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. And thank you for joining us for a very special Leaders Speak session with Ambassador Kanwal Sibyl on some burning issues of geopolitics. Ambassador Sibyl, it's a pleasure to have you and thank you for agreeing to do, the, do this session. You have been India's foreign secretary and you have served as a country's diplomat in many of the countries that are key players in the ongoing global test of power, Russia, United States, in the EU and Turkey. You have been speaking and writing about India's opportunities and threats in this chaos and hysteria. And we look forward to understanding where India stands in this prevailing disorder and what could be India's place and the role in the world order that results at the conclusion of this conflict. Ever since the cross-Atlantic financial crisis and growing aversion, inversion of America, the idea of a multipolar world has become quite popular everywhere, except the tribal fellowship of the Anglo-Saxon countries. The BRICS countries were touted as the next nucleus of the global economy in the aftermath of the blow up of the Western financial systems. And, this, and these countries have run with the idea of a multipolar world ever since. It is an idea that was popular even in Europe until China's current regime began to talk big 
and Russia resumed its overseas interventions. The multi multipolar group has demanded greater say in multilateral institutions and even created alternative regional institutions and economic programs. The battle for technological, legal, environmental, and moral standards has intensified between the West and the rest. However, while the world wants to be multilateral, there's a growing feeling that it is a horizon too far. India, China, and Russia, the top leaders of the multipolar movement, are, are contiguous and have serious territorial tangles. Russia has issues with both Russia. China has issues with both Russia and India. While China has tried to settle borders issues with Russia through trade-offs, it is trying to bully India into surrendering territory. The West has seen its opportunity and is trying to separate India from its eastern trio of emerging poles of the world power. As Russia's Ukraine invasion drags on, India has been wooed by both sides. Never before has an Indian government had so many summits and top-level delegations in such a short period of time. Even China, with, India's, with which India's relations hangs by a thread, has swallowed its pride and sent its foreign minister to India to keep India out of the Western camp on the Russia-Ukraine issue. America, Europe, and the Pacific governments have practically asked India to name its price for changing its position on Russia. India has been promised arms, energy, trade, technology, and has also been threatened with consequences if it does not join the anti-Russia formation. While this extreme attention can be milked for extracting special treatment for India's exports and diversifying India's weaponry, it also creates a vexed challenge for India's security autonomy and political sovereignty and policy sovereignty. There are, also, there are no free lunches after all, and India's wariness of the West's wooing is founded on its bitter experience of the West's behavior during all its wars in the past 60 years, and also the West's routine abandonment, abandonment of its Eastern allies after meeting its tactical objectives, much as can be seen in the situation in Afghanistan. However, India cannot continue to play hard to get for long, and there will be a price for being non-aligned as there has been in the past as well. This is a watershed moment in geopolitics and India must hedge its best bets on both outcomes of the Russia versus the West tussle. If the West succeeds in crushing the Russian economy and military, the unipolar US-centric world will get a longish tenure extension. However, if Russia gets its way with territory grab in Ukraine, or even if there's a stalemate, a multipolar polarity world could possibly get a boost. Ambassador Sibyl, we would like you to give us some clarity about the geopolitical situation and its direction, and tell us whether India would be better off pursuing a multipolar world order or play it safe by ob obeying the incumbent superpower. I have a few questions for you, which I would like to take along with some audience questions as well at the end of our session. However, to begin this session, may I request you to talk briefly about the prevailing geopolitical situation and India's best options in it. Over to you, Ambassador Sibyl. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sani. I, I don't think uh, there's need for me to really speak after you have outlined uh, all, the, that, uh, all the current global trends and where India stands. I think that was a very masterful uh, analysis of the present situation. And in fact, it covered everything that uh, one could say on the subject in uh, in, uh, in, in a few words. Uh, now, you know, you were very right in uh, talking about the origins of the multipolar world. Uh, in some senses, I was associated uh, with it uh, because this happened after the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union and communism as an ideology. And Francis Fukuyama, Fukuyama, the view that it was the end of history that the world was now uh, going to be democratic and will accept um, the market economy as the only way to achieve uh, economic uh, prosperity, things like that. Uh, United States, uh, during that phase of uh, unipolarity, uh, started reshaping uh, the world according to its uh, interests, its wishes, its desires, especially in the Middle East, and that promotion of democracy business, which was at the root of the 
Cold War as well as the market economy, they took these two principal axes of uh, Europe, American thinking uh, as uh, the way to reshape uh, the world so that every country accepts this. And they began by uh, the Middle East. Uh, and of course, we know uh, what happened. As a reaction to that, as a reaction to that, uh, Russia under Prime Minister Prima Kaur, uh, began talking about uh, India, Russia, and China getting together, three non-European uh, powers, uh, in order to counter uh, the US um, uh, U unipolar moment and uh, have these non-European countries uh, reflect and have a say uh, in, in global governance. Uh, that was the origin of the Russia-India-China dialogue. Later on, that expanded to BRICS. Actually, first is expanded to BRIC. The S was not there, South Africa was not there. Um, and then South Africa was added because uh, <clears throat> China insisted on its inclusion, although it didn't uh, fulfill the matrix uh, of uh, being part of uh, uh, the, this forum because the size of his economy uh, and everything else uh, did not merit that. Nevertheless, they wanted to have China's biggest partner in Africa was South Africa, uh, and which is why uh, they, they managed to put South Africa in. Frankly, to begin with, we had some hesitation because we had our own IPSA, diet, IPSA forum, uh, India, Brazil, South Africa. That was our way uh, to introduce the idea of multipolarity in terms of uh, bringing the global south together and encouraging cooperation between these three major continents, Latin America, uh, that is Brazil, Africa, and Asia, that is India. Uh, and therefore, we were a bit, uh, we were not altogether happy that the idea behind BRICS with an S was to bury IPSA because China had tried to intrude into that, but could not do so. Anyway, uh, this uh, idea of uh, having uh, forums, uh, non-European forums, uh, in which the West was totally excluded, um, and the non-European countries could then is discuss the issues of economic cooperation, peace and security, uh, and other issues, including terrorism and stuff like that uh, on their own separately uh, without the intrusion of the Western world uh, was uh, manifested uh, by the emergence of the SCO, for example, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, India, uh, as well as Pakistan, uh, were included in this. Included in this. Initially, uh, Russia very much wanted India in, but China insisted that India could not come in alone. And it could come in only if Pakistan was also included. Eventually, uh, Russia ceded, and uh, so India and Pakistan uh, became members of the SCO, and now Iran is also a member of the uh, SCO. Um, that is the, that is, if you like, uh, uh, the effort uh, to promote multipolarity. And you were right earlier on, I think you did mention about uh, uh, Europe also feeling uh, the heat from US unilateralist policies. And I was ambassador in France at that time when the French, in fact, uh, first uh, uh, coined this world of hyper puissance uh, relating to America and uh, talked of multipolarity. Um, so the idea of um, multipolarity was not simply limited to the non-European powers, but even within Europe itself, uh, countries like France, which have always uh, prized uh, their strategic autonomy, also felt that Europe must uh, emerge uh, from uh, the uh, grip of the United States and, and seek to have an independent say in foreign, in, in foreign policies, in international relations. Uh, France in itself didn't have the horsepower uh, to do that. And therefore, 
Um, if you remember, uh, at that time, because of the Iraq war, which France opposed and did not participate in, uh, the Americans uh, had a very strong reaction against the French, including uh, renaming their French fries as freedom fries, um, and pitting uh, new Europe against old Europe, uh, which actually you see also in the Ukraine conflict today, where they used uh, Poland and the East European and Central European countries uh, and the Baltic states, uh, which as smaller countries were very much under their grip and relied on the United States for their security, pit them against uh, the, the core of the European Union, countries like France and Germany. And since decisions in the European Union are made on the basis of consensus, so if you have a group of countries uh, which are going to follow the US line, then you will not be able or Europe will not be will not succeed in having the kind of strategic autonomy uh, uh, even if it was intended to be in cooperation with the United States and not against the United States uh, that would, would not have been possible uh, uh, if if uh, the, the consensus uh, was not obtainable because of the of the uh, use of the new Europe against the old Europe now, when you talk about multipolarity, if you remember at that time, uh, several poles were identified, the United States, the European Union, uh, Russia, Japan, India, and uh, China. Uh, if you look at the actual position, uh, one can't say that uh, we have uh, these poles actually emerging in a realistic manner. Now, India, of course, has been identified as a pole, but what does really pole mean? Pole means that you would have countries, a select number of countries, uh, which for political, security, economic issues uh, will be your partners and will support you and uh, will, will act on the global stage uh, in consultation, in cons consultation with you. Uh, Otherwise, you're not a pole. Um, now, we've seen that this is simply not the case because uh, although we've made a great deal of success in recent years in terms of uh, our neighborhood, neighborhood policy, but yet uh, we have big problems with our neighbors. I mean, in Nepal, we've seen that the Chinese are uh, eroding our influence and quite successfully um, in Sri Lanka, they have done that. In Maldives, they had done that very much under the Yameen government, though under the new government, they have lost their ground. Uh, Bangladesh, yes, there's a transformation of our relations with uh, uh, Bangladesh, but nevertheless, uh, China remains the biggest defense suppliers uh, of Bangladesh. And we've seen what happened in Myanmar, uh, which has uh, fallen once again into the grip of, uh, of China. And I'm not talking of Pakistan because I don't think I, I need to. Uh, 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 so, uh, so, so, so the, the emergence of India as a pole, in the sense that we would understand the word, uh, is not so evident at this point in time. Uh, you would also no, note that when it comes to voting in the United Nations, even a country like Bhutan, with which we have the best of relations, if you look at our overall relationship in the neighborhood, that doesn't vote alongside us. Even on the Ukraine, in the UN General Assembly, uh, they have voted in favor of the Western resolution while we abstained. And if you look at the pattern, this has happened uh, very, very often in the past. They very rarely vote in the same manner as we do. Uh, I suppose this is their way to show their, their independence in foreign policy, uh, but, uh, but there it is. Um, in terms of... Uh, Japan, yes, it is an economic powerhouse. Uh, it, 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 it is one country that was at the root of uh, the economic expansion in Southeast Asia, and they're still very deeply economically involved there. Though, of course, today, China has become a bigger partner of the ASEAN countries uh, than Japan is. But Japan simply cannot be a pole for two reasons. One, that uh, it doesn't have an independent foreign policy. 
and it doesn't have an independent uh, security policy. It, it entirely depends on the United States for its security. And, uh, and then, as you know, their uh, biggest economic partner uh, is China. And they are loggerheads with each other on, on security issues. So how do you act as a pole uh, if, on the one hand, you are uh, dependent on the United States for your defense and security, and in some senses, you are highly dependent on China for your economic prosperity. So there are limits. Uh, insofar as uh, uh, EU is concerned, uh, yes, it is uh, definitely a pole in, in any international uh, discussion. Uh, uh, the Europeans are key uh, to any, any uh, decision on the matters that uh, affect the international community as a whole, uh, especially if you take issues like uh, uh, climate change uh, or um, sustainable development uh, issues or any of the issues that the United Nations is grappling with, whether population issues or health issues or whatever. Uh, if there is no unity between United States and Europe, uh, it gives a great deal of margin of maneuver to the others. So to that extent, uh, you, the EU is a pole and, and as an economy is equal to the size of the United States of America and is double the population of the United States of America. So Europe certainly, uh, is a pole, though in the latest uh, Ukraine crisis, we've seen that there are huge limits to Europe <laughs> acting as a pole. They've become totally subservient uh, to the United States at the cost of their interests. And, the, and it's phenomenal how Germany uh, has uh, come under American tutelage. Uh, they, they are signing on the dotted line to what the Americans say at the cost of their interests, both security and, uh, and financial and economic. Uh, so I think uh, what we can dwell on that later, uh, that the current situation has eroded uh, considerably uh, the, the uh, European Union uh, as a kind of a separate pole in international affairs because we've seen a, a re-solidification uh, of the transatlantic unity, which is in the favor of the United States of America. U.S. remains the most powerful country in the world. There's absolutely no doubt about it, and will remain so uh, for a long time. The manner in which it has been able to mobilize international support uh, behind uh, uh, them, themselves on Ukraine uh, sh shows the kind of uh, uh, power they have, and the weaponization of what earlier on um, Rekha said about what the manner in which they have weaponized everything uh, finance uh, and uh, sports and uh, um, culture uh, and uh, um, economy, economy, of course, the manner in which, uh, you know, the United States was always accusing and the rest of the world was accusing China of weaponizing uh, critical supply chains and critical raw materials. But the uh, United States have weaponized not only um, finance, but they have weaponized the current existing international order, which they themselves created through their policy of sanctions. And the, these sanctions actually terrify <laughs> the rest of the world because they don't want, to, don't want to fall afoul of the United States. These sanctions are so complex, they do not know when and how they can be accused of violating them and lose access to the American financial system. Um, Russia has been thrown out of SWIFT. Uh, the private property of Russian uh, businessmen uh, has been confiscated without due process of law. So everything that the West stood for in terms of uh, uh, property rights uh, has been negated. They talk about a, a free press and free flow of information, but they have banned uh, Russian media altogether. <laughs> the Europe has done it. Um, so there it is. Now, China certainly has emerged as, as, as a pole, but in, in, in a purely uh, economic sense. I, first of all, it is uh, now the second largest economy. 
Uh, it is the biggest exporter, exporting country in the world. Uh, it has uh, control over critical uh, raw materials, which, which the world discovered during the, the pandemic and, and critical supply chains. Uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is unparalleled. There's nothing that the World Bank uh, has done or can do in terms of uh, developmental, so-called developmental aid, because I don't want to call China's BRI developmental aid, but they project it as such. But even if you accept what they're saying, uh, the international organizations uh, are in no, in no way comparable in terms of their capacity to fund global infrastructure like the BII uh, is being used by the Chinese to do so, which then now they're using uh, alongside the infrastructure to uh, use that as for the di digital infrastructure, because that's one area on which they are ahead of the rest of the world, and they want to capitalize uh, on that. Uh, they have created the Asian Infrastructure and uh, uh, Investment Fund uh, as some sort of a alternative to uh, the ADB and even the World Bank. So to give themselves the capacity uh, to um, uh, fund uh, development uh, in countries which they target for uh, political uh, reasons. They have now developed a very considerable military power. No country in the history of the world has developed its Navy as rapidly as China has done. The total number of uh, naval uh, assets that China has is larger than that of the United States number, not in terms of capability or, 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 or overall capacity, but in terms of numbers, this is the kind of uh, uh, Navy that, that they have built up. And uh, they're quite open uh, in, their, in their white papers on uh, security and maritime security and everything else, that they intend to develop a blue water Navy to protect their sea lanes of communication and their assets abroad. Um, which means that uh, this Navy is intended uh, to, um, uh, to act uh, across the oceans uh, everywhere. And this is a problem that India is going to face. Now, one problem they have, which affects their character as a pole, is that unlike the United States, which has uh, multiple bases across the world, uh, they are in God knows over 100 countries. Uh, I forget the figure. <clears throat> and China has <clears throat> no base except a uh, potential base in Pakistan and in Djibouti. Uh, so in, all, in terms of projecting their power like the Americans do, uh, there, there is some way for them to go. But I think they are in that sense uh, much more of a pole uh, than Russia. Now Russia, even before this conflict and they got bogged down in Ukraine, uh, Russia tried to uh, develop itself uh, as the center of a new Eurasian economic order. Uh, and that's why they have built this, uh, where not all, but several of the erstwhile constituent states of the Soviet Union <clears throat> are partners. And they have the CSTO, the, the Central Asian Security Organization, uh, where barring Turkmenistan and I think Uzbekistan, all others are members. So in that sense also, they are keeping these uh, countries under their control. And you saw that in the case of Kazakhstan, when uh, there was an attempted, uh, you know, at, at, at overthrow of the regime, uh, the, the, the Kazakh president called in uh, Russia for support and they sent in their forces temporarily and stabilized the situation. But the Ukraine uh, uh, situation and what is happening and the sanctions imposed on Russia to isolate it and e economically debilitate it, and even as Biden says, um, push for a regime change in, in uh, Russia, uh, actually uh, demonstrates that uh, Russia has ceased to be the kind of uh, pole that it was in the past and it, uh, uh, and it uh, had the ambitions to continue uh, to be. And one lesson that all of us should learn from this is that you may become a nuclear power, but unless you are a very strong economic power, you're very vulnerable. 
you know, here's a country with nuclear weapons as large as the United States and can actually the only country that can destroy the United States. And it's in the process of, I, let's say, destroyed in inverted commas by the United States, because that's what the United States is saying openly. Uh, and there is a lesson in it uh, for us. Now, insofar as uh, economic multipolarity is concerned, I think uh, partly I've already alluded to that uh, as to what the Chinese have done uh, in terms of carving out a huge space uh, internationally, economically. But there you see actually uh, multipolarity. Uh, um, and uh, that is one reason why the G7 moved to G20, because it was no longer for G70 after the uh, economic meltdown in 2008 to manage the global financial system. Uh, and they had to include uh, 13 other countries to come together, concert with each other, and try and stabilize the global economy. Um, and then, of course, the weight of China in the global economic uh, system uh, how, uh, you know, slowdown of growth in China or economic troubles in China will affect the health of the international economy. Uh, so to that extent, uh, there is definitely economic uh, multipolarity. And India, on the economic side, is doing now beginning to do better because the rest of the world is developing stakes in the Indian economy. And uh, if you look at all the projections of the uh, OECD or the World Bank uh, or whatever, uh, they're very favorable, very favorable uh, in terms of India's economic rise. And on top of that, India's economic rise, unlike that of China, is not seen as a threat by the international community in the same way. Uh, so to that extent, the going is good for India. Uh, India is uh, uh, progressively uh, being recognized uh, as a poll with all the other, uh, you know, um, caveats that I had earlier, earlier uh, mentioned. Um, now, the other aspects what we have to see in terms of uh, the subject on which I'm speaking is that uh, the uh, the Ukraine war has pushed uh, Russia closer to China. And uh, this will have long-term consequences, whether Russia is weakened or not weakened. Uh, but these two countries are now going to come together because what the Americans have done in terms of weaponizing finance and uh, asserting the hegemony of the dollar is that they inevitably, inevitably will encourage other countries uh, to develop alternative systems including an alternative to SWIFT, to uh, trade more in their national currencies, uh, even which was, which was on the BRICS agenda, which has not really uh, been implemented and it's difficult to do so, have their own credit rating agencies because the credit rating agencies are also used as tools by the West uh, to put economic pressure uh, on developing countries and force them into taking decisions which are more conducive to their uh, their interests. Uh, and after what has happened in terms of confiscating of foreign exchange reserves and the atrocious idea of using them now for the reconstruction of Ukraine, no. uh, this is going to send uh, alarm signals all over the world that uh, you, you better find alternative ways of investment uh, of your uh, foreign exchange reserves, your gold reserves, because there's talk of also confiscating Russia's gold reserves. Uh, so this is going to actually encourage other countries to move out of the dollar denomination system. And once the oil starts getting traded, not in petrodollars, but in other currencies, then you will see the beginning uh, of the uh, collapse, well, collapse is a strong word, beginning of the uh, weakening of the financial grip of the United States or the grip of the dollar uh, on the global uh, system. Um, the other unfortunate trend that we see is that unilateralism has come back in the way I've already described in terms of the decisions that have been taken. And this is Western unilateralism, not alone that of the United States, but US and EU combined. So 
all the aspirations that India and others had that we want a reformed international order, we want a reform of the international financial and political institutions of the UN Security Council, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All that for the time being seems uh, an agenda which uh, doesn't have much legs. Uh, we will see in the next few years what cost the West pays for the mistakes they have committed. Uh, but for the time being, any talk of this kind uh, has very little resonance. On the contrary, as you said earlier, that we are being put under pressure uh, to change our position and all kinds of arguments are being used uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, push us in that direction. Uh, the argument of democracy, the argument of uh, morality, of uh, rules-based international order, uh, about human uh, rights and stuff like that. Um, so, um, so in India, uh, we are withstanding this pressure uh, successfully. Uh, may, maybe I can, in the question and answers, uh, dwell more on this subject, but we made it clear that uh, we are going to pursue what is basically in our national interest. And, and that pursuit of national interest doesn't actually in any way conflict with the national interest of either the United States or Europe. It's a different matter. They're used to dominating everybody and uh, forcing countries to toe their line. But if you objectively look at their national interests, how does India's uh, so neutrality on the Ukraine conflict uh, affect them. Uh, supposing India goes ahead and condemns uh, the uh, Russia, how uh, the result would be we'll, we will destroy our relationship with, the, with Russia. We'll pay the price. But what they'll gain is a feather in their cap. That's all. That they went the list of countries that have voted or condemned uh, Russia, they include India. And it will be a diplomatic success for them that they have something which they're obsessed with, that India must be pushed away from its, its the canker of non-alignment that is seeped into our political and thinking. And that's what they want to achieve. Uh, that's what they will achieve, but at the cost of our relationship with the United States. They, they don't expect us to send, a, send, a, our, send weaponry to Ukraine or get involved in that uh, conflict or, or impose the sanctions on, you, on Ukraine. Um, and when it comes to uh, condemnation of human, UN Human Rights Council and this and that about killings and Bucha massacre and everything else, I mean, you know, any objective person can make out a list of all the foreign interventions the United States and Europe have been involved in, whether Iraq or Libya or Syria or Yugoslavia, and the number of casualties that occurred. Afghanistan, Afghanistan, the number of casualties that have occurred. Uh, and of course, handing over Afghanistan to the Taliban. And this is such a reversal of policy and the war on terror that the terrorists who were dislodged from Afghanistan after the 9-11, the whole country has now been handed over to them, including weaponry. So, I mean, these are polemics we can engage in. It doesn't help us this way or that way. And it's best to avoid these polemics because we have very important interests with the United States, which, which we must nurture. And it is one country that, that is most critical in terms of our future growth in so many ways. Uh, but if the Americans uh, and the Europeans push us unnecessarily into a kind of a debate, then we have to react, which our foreign minister has done even the recent uh, rising now. Uh, finally, uh, you know, our discourse, if you see what the external affairs minister keeps saying, that uh, he talks about a rebalanced world. He's not talking about a multipolar world. Uh, but he does. He does in two ways. First of all, he says that a before we talk about a multipolar world, we must have a multipolar Asia, which means that China should not have this ambition uh, of uh, being the dominant power. Uh, in Asia and being the hegemon there, which India won't accept. So they must accept that India is an equal power uh, before all of us, whether in BRICS or elsewhere, talk about multipolarity. The other is that on a different plane, he talks about rebalancing. 
And rebalancing doesn't necessarily mean multipolarity because it doesn't have the concept of poles. It's simply a rebalance can be, uh, is a very fluid notion. Even 80-20 is, from, let's say from 80-10 to 80-20 is rebalancing. Uh, so there was a lot of flexibility, a lot of flexibility there. I think that is a wiser way to look at uh, what lies ahead that we should put for, uh, 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 we should back the idea of rebalancing rather than talk about multipolarity, because that also has the connotation of opposing American power. And that is how this, uh, uh, this term is understood, and that's the origin of the term in any case. And finally, one last word, that uh, for India to really become a pole, in whatever sense we look at it, uh, we have to become a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, that is our due. That is something we can legitimately aspire for. And that will give us the kind of role that we expect that we should have in, in a changing world where uh, uh, our size, our demography, our economic strength, growing economic strength, our military power, our civilizational uh, contribution to humanity, all these would be then eventually ultimately recognized and India will have its uh, new place in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sibyl. It's been uh, truly enlightening uh, uh, remarks by you and very frankly, it's, it's, it's very heartening to know that while, while India can't claim itself to be a pole at this point in time, but to very frankly, the steps that we are taking both economically, politically, as well as uh, with our neighbors uh, seems to indicate that we, we would reach a position whereby we could aspire to be a pole in the near future. And it's also very interesting that uh, the, the way that you put the current bipolar world as, as may exist between the NATO-aligned US-led uh, uh, Western powers and China, and that dynamic is really is playing out as we can see. Uh, there's some questions that uh, that uh, that I that I had, but I'd like to break them up into a couple of parts for you because we do have about 15 minutes left, and I did want to get in a couple of the questions that our, our audience have also asked. Um, and uh, Ambassador Sibyl, maybe I could lay it out in 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 the form of maybe a, a set of questions, and then I leave it to you to to take up whichever part you may like. You did talk about interests, and I think that in geopolitics, they say that there are no uh, good guys, and very frankly, everyone aligns their own policies around, around their interests. For us Indians, uh, what are really our interests, and, and, and are any of those ones that we could compromise? The West seems to always play on shared values as being uh, a very common interest and something that is supreme amongst all which, which binds us together with them. Is that really something that is paramount in the way that we as Indian and as our political leadership sees it as well? That is uh, one in terms, of the, in terms of seeing how our foreign policy and the continuity of our foreign policy lives on in these in terms of interests. The second question was in terms of the Ukraine-Russia war itself. Uh, how do you think it's going to end up? Is there, is, is, is there, of course, there's, there's, I think if we knew the right answer as to how it would end, it would, uh, uh, it may be over by now already. But uh, in your opinion, um, is there a, a, a potential for a nuclear war here? Is there any potential for this to uh, escalate beyond borders? Or is this something that we've seen in terms of multiple wars in the past where it just lingers on for decades and people lose interest? And it, there are enough examples which have existed in the past. Uh, you did touch upon the fact that uh, uh, that um, the West uh, has has had its... Uh, everyone has seen the experience of Western war, the, the West's wars in Afghanistan and Syria and a variety of different places, including Yugoslavia. How does this end up, in, in your opinion, um, there are also some questions from the audience, which I'd like to just uh, read out to you. And I, I think you could uh, take them in whichever order you may wish. Uh, and this is from Jagdish Khatri. Uh, Sir, do you think our close relations with the US during the Trump era have raised the West's expectations from India? He also does ask, has the West pitted Ukraine against Russia to serve its own geopolitical interests at the cost of huge losses to Ukraine? Um, 
Uh, lastly, I will just give one more question. And I think this may be a yes or no answer from you. This is from Dr. APS Man, who asks, uh, will China agree to the proposal of India as a permanent member of the Security Council? And I think that you ended with that. So, sir, I think there are a lot of questions that I placed to you, but uh, to whatever extent that I think we could get to in the next 15, 20 minutes, uh, I, I, I hope that we may be able to cover some of these. Now, insofar as uh, uh, interests are concerned, yes, every country theoretically uh, follows its interests. But, you know, uh, the elites of any country at any given point in time or the policy makers of the country at any given point of time, inter interpret those interests uh, depending on uh, the situation around you and in the world in general. In other words, barring uh, certain issue, certain uh, elements uh, which will always guide your interests, the, there are a huge number of uh, components of any definition of national interest, which gives flexibility uh, to governments to change their policies. And you've seen, uh, you've seen this uh, repeatedly in international relations. That if you look at the ups and downs of relationship between India and China, uh, at one moment we are bye-bye, and uh, then uh, we enter into a phase of what they say, bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> and, and then we had from 19, 93 onwards, another phase of uh, uh, reducing tensions, uh, re-engaging each other, building up uh, economic ties, um, setting up mechanisms to resolve the border uh, issue, have actual agreements on that to stabilize it. And then everything gets reversed. And then uh, today you've seen where we are where we are openly now saying that uh, there's no question of normalization of relations unless the situation on the border becomes uh, normal. And we're now openly uh, talking about uh, China much more than we ever done as an adversary. And we have 50,000 troops on their side and 50,000 troops on our side uh, facing each other. So, so then how do you in this whole context define our national interest? So the national interest sort of keeps changing depending on... Uh, uh, how the situation around us is, in, is evolving. Similarly, take Russia and China. Uh, Russia and China actually uh, had a, border, a serious border war in the, uh, in the 60s. Um, and they broke. Uh, they broke uh, on ideological grounds. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the border, they managed to settle their border. And today, countries which historically uh, if you look at the whole history of Russia, Tsarist Russia, and relationship uh, with the, uh, the Chinese empires, it is amazing that they are now saying that they have a friendship which uh, has no bounds. Uh, so, uh, how real that is, how much, how long this will endure, we'll see. For the time being, yes, there is a transformation of their ties. So, there are ups and downs in the relation. Look at Look at uh, U.S. and uh, and uh, and Russia um, after the collapse of uh, the uh, Soviet Union. There was this great phase of uh, Yeltsin, uh, where uh, in fact Russia opened itself completely to the Americans and uh, want, and allowed them to uh, actually uh, steer them uh, towards uh, uh, democracy and towards uh, the market economy and everything else. And now you see how the relationship has soured. But far more important is US and India. The one country, and that will answer the first question you asked me, uh, or the, the one country and a democratic country which has been most sanctioned by any country is India, by the United States. Right from the time 1974, when we had our uh, peaceful nuclear explosion, we have been under sanctions and very severe sanctions. In fact, maybe some of your people uh, may, may have forgotten that uh, the nuclear supply group and the earlier version of it, the London group, was set up in order to in order to uh, 
to prevent India from going nuclear. And along with that, the Vasanar Agreement, the MTCR were all intended to prevent India from developing its missile capability and of throttling the flow of dual-use technology to India. If you remember even the wretched Cray computer we bought, and I was so humiliated, I was in the ministry then, and I went to visit in this uh, meteorological bhavan that we have. Uh, the Cray computer was there, and there was an American from, an from the American embassy who was sitting there because they wanted to make sure that you use, used it only for meteorological purposes and not for any equations to develop your nuclear capability. And look where we are today uh, with the United States of America, uh, the, the country that was the biggest target of their non-proliferation regime. They changed their policy and have, in fact, in a sense, removed the non-proliferation issue from their relations with us. And we were we signed a nuclear deal and everything else. So, so what, what does it say about American interests or our interests and, and the interplay of those interests? These interests keep changing. However, beyond all that, there are some interests, if you like, which are which don't change. One is uh, your geographical position. Other is your neighborhood. And the third is uh, your size. And, uh, and your capacities and your mindset in terms of what you think is your legitimate role in international affairs. Now, in India, after all, we are, in terms of uh, geograph geography, we are the seventh largest country in the world, I think. In terms of demography, we are the second, maybe in a few years, we'll be the largest uh, country in the world in terms of demography. Uh, our human talent is, is, is remarkable, remarkable, although there are a lot of problems, but we have highly developed uh, uh, human uh, uh, the, the, the talent in our country is highly, highly, highly developed. And then uh, we have a vision of ourselves of the role that we want to play. Uh, we, are, we feel we are just too big to become an appendage of anybody. We have to stand our own feet. Uh, and uh, be self-reliant and uh, as much as we can. Uh, and hence, we have, we have right from the start uh, tried to develop our inherent capabilities, even if it was slowly and by fits and starts. And we have been late in reaching the point we have reached compared to what China has done. But nevertheless, uh, in terms of uh, what we've done domestically, uh, I think it is, it is not laudable with all handicaps we have of our, of our rather chaotic democratic system. Now, th therefore, I think it's part of the thinking of people in India that we can't be subservient to anyone. We have to keep our counsel. Uh, we have to be what we are uh, and have a notion of ourselves and the future that we want uh, to have for ourselves. So these are some of the things which explain why uh, we don't want to join military alliances. We don't want to uh, compromise some of our core interests simply because we are pushed in a certain direction by uh, the stronger power in the alliance, in this case, let's say the United States of, uh, of America. And so far as shared values is concerned, so I don't know what this is posturing. This is posturing. Now, when uh, now when you talk about, let's say, the the democracy. Now, I've, I've been asking this question very often from many. That name one instance, one instance where United States or the democratic countries have sided with us at the cost of their interests because we are a democracy. In fact. In all these years, we were a democracy. Was, was Pakistan a democracy? Were they sided with Pakistan? They still, Pakistan is their major non-NATO <laughs> ally. They have handed over Afghanistan to the Pakistan Taliban regime without worrying about our democracy and the security challenges to our democracy. And uh, while we were a democracy, they built up communist China and made it the monster that it is today. Did they give any, well, any importance to the values when it came because China has been openly saying that we totally reject your values. 
we don't we reject democracy we reject western values and they're saying it openly and yet the biggest economic partner of uh, united states is uh, is uh, china so, so where do values uh, come into this what about uh, europe uh, the, the the germany's biggest uh, economic partner after the united states is, is china 245 billion dollars of trade but do they share values madame merkel actually was very anti trump she said that we don't share the values of uh, uh, united states anymore under trump but do they share the values of xi jinping so let's not get into <laughs> that kind of uh, obfuscating debate about democracy and values and, and this and that uh, they have very limited role in international affairs now insofar as uh, how the ukraine thing will end up uh, there's a you know as they say the fog of war uh, we really really don't know uh, what the reality is and i must say i must say that the manner in which the information warfare has been conducted uh, around ukraine by the west is absolutely remarkable absolutely remarkable you look at the indian media also they'll think that ukraine is a long lost friend and russia is being uh, anti india all this while and you know so much sympathy outpouring of sympathy for ukraine i mean we are not uh, enemies of ukraine but there is absolutely no comparison between our relationship with russia and with ukraine but instrumentalized and instantly photographs uh, appearing constantly about bombings, about buildings destroyed, about infrastructure destroyed, tanks destroyed, bodies in body bags and stuff like that. Constantly, constantly. This is being done as part of a long-standing demoniz demonization of Putin uh, and uh, uh, Russia. Now, there are two ways of looking at it. One is that the <clears throat> Putin realizes right from the beginning that uh, you know, the day they are fraternal countries. There are a lot of Ukrainians in Russia, a lot of Russians in Ukraine. There's intermarriage, this and that. Uh, number two, there is no way that uh, Russia <clears throat> can uh, annex Ukraine. Therefore, their military operation cannot be with the purpose of annexing Ukraine. Their purpose, declared purpose, is to uh, prevent the massacre uh, this has gone on for seven, eight years of the Russian populations in the East, in, in the Luhansk and Donetsk republics and this and that, which is the basis of the intervention. Uh, and that's what they're doing. They're taking control uh, of the Donetsk and Luhansk area because it was never fully under the control of the Russian speaking people of that region. And now with the Russian intervention, they're enlarging the control over the entire area and extending further to Crimea. So these could be the uh, war aims of, of Russia. And if these are the war aims, then Russia will succeed. But the price Russia has paid for this is immense in terms of uh, losses of equipment and men. Uh, and this is not going to end because now the West is openly, openly supplying more and more lethal arms uh, to Ukraine because the Americans are openly saying that they want Russia to get bogged down. They want the war to be prolonged. Uh, and they would want to do an Afghanistan on Russia once again, hoping that this will end up like it happened in the case of the Soviet Union. It collapsed because of what happened in Afghanistan. That's the reasoning. And Ukraine will cause the collapse of the Putin regime. And some more uh, amenable leader will come to power in Russia. And they will therefore have the opportunity to grab its immense resources. This is what they really want for a long time. Uh, but the long and short is that uh, Russia is paying a severe price for this, but Russia won't collapse. You know, the sanctions and all. Look at Iran with, hard, with very few resources, uh, has been able to withstand the, the US sanctions and the European sanctions for so many years without collapsing. So there's no way Russia is going to collapse. But pain will be inflicted and it will have some impact on our own relations with Russia because of uh, uh, 
uh, payments issues and, and rise in oil prices and what have you. Uh, finally, uh, whether because of our improved relations with the Trump or expectations of the United States have risen? No, no, no. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the nuclear deal was signed under President Bush, not under President Trump. That was the beginning of a real breakthrough and transformation of our ties uh, with the United States. Uh, yes, with Trump, uh, it, it became more showy because he's a very showy <laughs> character. <laughs> and you had all these Houston stuff and uh, in Gujarat and, and uh, okay, that was a certain kind of phase. Uh, uh, but uh, it's not as if uh, it did anything remarkable uh, for India over and above what had been done by either, uh, either Bush or Obama. Yes, on one or two issues, uh, we had a little quieter time. These are the human rights issues, which have resurfaced again, and by lobbies in the United States, uh, they pick up on our internal domestic issues, and then now promote this idea: you're not a full-fledged democracy, you're a flawed democracy. The you know, anti-minority, the persecution of this and persecution of that. Now that that thing was absent during Trump's regime, uh, but. Uh, uh, Otherwise, during Obama, they were troubling us on this also. Uh, so I don't think that the, the expectations in that sense have arisen. But, you know, from my point of view, I think we should not have logic as to why don't we have also the logic what we expect from America? Why be defensive all the time? This is... This is this shows lack of self-confidence, that we have to please the Americans. Well, why can't the Americans please us also? So uh, I think th that mindset in India is beginning to change. And the manner in which the foreign minister reacted to some of the uh, questions he was asked recently at the Raisina dialogue. And finally, uh, China, no, no, no. It will, it will certainly not uh, uh, support India's permanent membership the face of it, they support it. The only country that does not support is China. Even in the RIC dialogue, even in the BRICS dialogue, but more important than the RIC dialogue where Russia supports our permanent membership, in the joint statements that get issued after the RICS RIC meeting or BRICS meeting, all they say is we support an increased role for India in the United Nations. Very patronizing formulation. And I've been saying, why do we it just demeans us? What does it mean that we they support an increased role of India in the United Nations? Uh, so to answer your question, no, I don't think China will support India's permanent membership. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Sibyl. Uh, unfortunately, I think we've we've run out of time. We have many many questions, and I'd like to apologize to Kailash Nath Chobe, uh, Mr. Mahadevan. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Goswami, Major General Sudhir Kumar, and Sanjay Bell. Uh, Ambassador Sibyl, I'll have the Secretariat send you th these questions so that you would have them on your record as to what are the questions that, are, that members and participants in today's uh, Leader Speak series have, uh, have for you. We have uh, nearly 500 people who've been listening uh, directly, about 220 off on, uh, on this Zoom channel and nearly 270 plus through uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. So we've had a good participation and a good recording of uh, a very uh, insightful uh, observation into India's role in a multipolar world, as well as some more current topics, such as uh, the, the current uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, as well as the role of India's foreign policy and interests in the future. Thank you again, uh, Ambassador Sibyl. It's been a pleasure to interact with you, for all our members and for all the guests who've joined us today. We look forward to engaging with you further in the near future. Uh, Rekha, back to you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sibyl. I think you could see from the number of questions which were there, 
that definitely IMA members are interested in foreign policy. And we'd love to have you back again, uh, perhaps at some other forum to uh, give us some more inputs and insights as you have done today. Thank you for an excellent session and thank you all for joining us uh, uh, for the session. My apologies also, uh, I'm adding to Nikhil's apologies to those whose questions we couldn't take today, but uh, many thanks for uh, joining us this evening. And thank uh, you so much, Ambassador Sibir. My pleasure, thank you for inviting me. Uh, could have answered those questions, but maybe my responses were a bit too long to the few questions you asked. But they were very interesting. I think you gave no, no, us a yeah. very good insight into what's happening, which is, uh, it, was, it was fascinating, I thank, would say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All, thank all you, the, Nikhil. All the best to you and your members. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bill. Thank you, Rekha. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.